Welcome back, Lumberjacks, and all you construction folks to episode four. If you're new, I'm Lou, your host of the Builder Upper Show, a podcast where we talk about everything in construction and trades. Now let's get into it. I would like to welcome our guest, Marshall Wilkinson, the New York construction boss. The hardest market in the world. Marshall, welcome. Thanks, Lou. Great to be here. Appreciate it. Absolutely. So tell me, who is Marshall Wilkinson? Uh, Marshall Wilkinson is uh, a second generation contractor and construction manager from New York. I grew up in Long Island, New York. Um, nice suburban life, right? Um, but a uh, person who's dedicated his life to this business carried a torch from my father and uh, and fell in love with the business and is now currently a consultant and a coach and I help contractors scale. But uh, most importantly, in my core, I'm a construction man, been that way since the high chair. What was your specialty, Marshall? Electrical. And what got you into it like in the beginning? Well, I really didn't have a choice. I'm second generation, so you know, I've, I, uh, I kind of, uh, already had a path set for me. Um, all I ever heard at the dinner table growing up was how to run projects and how to do jobs. We specialize in water and wastewater treatment plants. So, uh, union shop, uh, class A heavy work. And, uh, since a kid, my dad's been running those projects. The New York city DEP has the largest capital project budget. At least they have had for a very long time. So, they made a business decision to move in that direction. And so uh, I've been learning how to run water treatment plants since I'm one years old. <laughs> and we hear that a lot. We hear, you know, father, son, dad gets him into it. When did you decide to become a construction owner? Well, I wasn't allowed in the business until it, it, our business in, until 25, 26 years old. Okay. So I don't, I don't think my, my father didn't want, to you know be called out on nepotism he's worked with guys for a very long time he didn't want those guys to think that the new young kid was going to come in and because i had the same last name that i was immediately going to get a corner office and i was going to you know climb the corporate ladder i had to prove myself so um i worked every job of construction on my way up i worked with various different contractors and different positions on different types of projects before my dad thought that I had the chops and I was strong enough to come into the business. And, uh, and then what I did is I, I injected a more of a corporateness and a professionalism and more of a sales orientation to the business where uh, he was really more of operations and a kind of guy who really understood the field and the tools where I came in. And uh, although I had that background, I also, I brought some, a little bit more corporateness to the business and, and, and put systems in place and scaled it from there. Awesome. Yeah. I like how you, you made that transition and you made it successfully. What is something, you know, today that you wish you knew when you started? Oh man, a lot, a lot, <laughs> really. <laughs> you know, I learned a lot of lessons and I learned them the hard way because the way I was brought up was my dad, you know, I use this reference a lot, you know, kind of the way Tiger Woods, father Earl Woods dealt with Tiger is definitely how my dad dealt with me. He was grooming me. And so when, when you have all of that confidence and you think that you know it all and your, your father's telling you, you're the man, you're the king, you're going to be the best that ever lived. You know, really, it, it's really as dramatic as that. I had a lot of confidence and I didn't have all of the knowledge and the skill to back it up. Construction is a very interesting business because you need to have experience. It's very experience driven because every project is unique. Fires are on every project. You have to build the construction muscle, so to speak. And so although I had the information, I knew how to run a job. I knew how to run a company. I knew how to run work. I understood everything about project management and scale and, and buying out subs and, and scheduling and, and estimating and all the machinations therein, there's a difference between knowing how to do it and been doing it for a few years, like I was, right? You know, obviously growing up as a teenager, I'm working and, and working in the business and stuff. But, you know, from 18 to 25, I'm in other places, you know, uh, making my bones, so to speak. And 
you run into guys who've been doing this for 35, 40 years. You do not know more than those guys. Mm. And and that was that was something I had to learn the hard way because I would play smash mouth football with guys that have been in the business for 40 years and think my way was better. And sometimes old school is the only school is what I learned. So I had to learn that lesson a lot. I also, I also learned very valuable lessons with, with employees and, and human resources and in letting the line out on guys and giving people time to breathe and grow and not be so harsh on people. And, and then, you know, obviously you're a for-profit business and when you're a young guy, you want to make a lot of money. And I certainly did. <clears throat> and I certainly did want to make a lot of money and did make a lot of money, but I was always counting other people's pockets and I, I, I had to learn that these people were resources for us and they were tools for us to earn more. And really what my job was as I matured into an executive was to make sure that I gave them the tools and the leadership and the systems to make them successful rather than saying, Oh, I'm paying this guy this much money. This guy's making that much more than me. You know, as a young guy, I'd be like, I know this guy's making X, Y, Z. And uh, that was just immaturity. Yeah. But I, I learned all those lessons the hard way and in, and in a very embarrassing manner. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, that's why I, I know them so well now. And I impart all those lessons on all my clients because it, it, it is a difficult thing, especially if you're a first generation contractor and you're coming from a family that were maybe employees and weren't business owners. Mm -hmm. You're taking a very specific employee type of mindset, bringing it into an entrepreneurial realm where our biggest expense is the human resource. And a lot of times I see a lot of frustration around the owners and their employees. And although it's warranted, it has to be, you have to look at it through a very specific lens because we need these people to make us money. We need them to deliver projects for us. And so not everybody's 100%. And I learned that. And then I learned to look at everybody, all my employees as a, as a profit center. They're revenue silos for me, each person. They need to deliver a certain type of revenue back to me if they're on a revenue generation end of things like project management and in the field. Mm -hmm. And then if they're not, if they're just overhead carry, they are a part of me delivering my product or my service. And I, I just matured as an executive to understand what all of that meant. And I learned those lessons the hard way. But there are, there are quite a few lessons that I learned on the way up. That's for sure. Mm, well put. During those few struggles that you had, or if there was any struggles that stuck out, what motivated you to work through that? Well, I mean, I was motivated to be the best, you know, like, you know, just because, you know, you come up in a family business and I like to refer to us as like a family dynasty. My dad's Robert Wilkinson and he's done probably 12 to 15 billion in work. He's a, wow. he's a very big player. He's very well known in the public works uh, world, the class A world of New York city. So I was motivated to be better than him. <laughs> I, I never, because of the way he groomed me, I also didn't want to be a person to say, Oh, you know, that's Wilkinson's kid. I wanted people to say that's Wilkinson's kid. He's sharp as attack. Watch out. He'll cut your head off. Right. And, and because I wanted that to be my reputation, I just, I had a massive burning desire to be that person. And I figured out the only way to be that guy is to actually be that guy to actually know your stuff. And so I just had a desire to learn all of it and master it. Sounds like you filled those shoes very well. Well, we have a lot of construction owners that tap into this podcast. A lot of them are wondering, how did you scale your business? Is there any tactics that you feel listeners can benefit from? Absolutely. Um, scaling isn't something that's done on accident. Scaling comes from preparation and having a plan in place and working that plan. 90% um, of contractors, I believe, go out because they operate under the wrong system. They don't have the right strategies and systems in place. And you don't know what you don't know. I'm fortunate enough, fortunate enough to be around so many big boys that I stole strategies and I stole systems from them so to speak. You know, I, I adopted a lot of what I saw worked. And I also noticed that in our business, there are a lot of regional players in New York. So you have these family businesses that became union shops. The dad started them and the kids take them over. And I, what I 
recognized was they still were extremely dysfunctional and unorganized because the, because the 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 starter usually comes out of the field off of the tools and mm. then there's a there's a period of years that he's fighting to grow a business and scale it and do his absolute very best but he's not necessarily a CEO and doesn't understand very particular business concepts traditional business concepts and strategies and systems that could work in a contracting company. They're just tweaked a little bit. And so I, I, what I did is I modeled some of the bigger players. I befriended a lot of them. Um, I got to know them intimately. I got to know the inside of their business. And, you know, based on that, based on my own education and, you know, what I learned, uh, you know, I, I, I went to B school and I have an education. So I brought that corporateness into the, into the business and so laying out a plan for, for scaling is required. So you have to have the right strategy in place. You also need to be, I've never met a contractor or saw a contracting company that scaled that was hands off. Mm-hmm. Can I run a construction company from a yacht? You know, if my dad didn't have a stroke, he'd be in the office right now, 70 mm-hmm. something years old. In fact, you know, where I come from also, I, I do know for a fact there's a 70 plus year old man right now in the office uh, working at his desk in Long Island. I know exactly, you know, I'm not going to say the name, but I know exactly who he is. I know he's there right now. The kids are running the business. You have to be hands on. So you could automate processes. And now because of technology, we could be distant and I could be at home and I still could be tracking tracking job cost data, which is one of the biggest holes that I find in all contractors. And that's the it's my number one pet peeve is to know where I am at any given time, any day on any project. And the fact that there are millions of dollars at, at risk every day vis-a-vis material and labor, especially if you're a union shop, you're working on these big jobs and you're like net 60 out, but you got to wait a month to get an approved rec. So you're really 90 days out. And you're paying union labor. You have massive carry. and You don't know where you stand on the job to me is madness. No other business in the world would do that. The Wall Street guys when they deploy capital to get a return, the number one thing on their mind is risk management. So I adopted that philosophy and I take that uh, with me. And that's how I create my job cost uh, tracking spreadsheets and systems that I have in place. But the systems are the number one thing. The secondary thing, um, I guess they're both equally important, but I I guess I'm going to kind of bifurcate the system a little bit. You have an operation system and strategies that need to be in place then you have to have a perpetual, ongoing, constant system in place for lead generation. Contractors are are stagnant. They get leads and then they get so much work and they stop marketing. Mm -hmm. Then they stop going out there and driving revenue and and, and meeting clients. Or the world that I come from is a rip them and read them world, low bid. But you have to supplement that with private work as well. And so being a salesman, getting out there and closing deals – is equally as important to know that you have the ability to close deals and negotiate contracts and take that and stick it into a system that outputs on the other end a delivered project. If you can, if you have the confidence in your system and the ability to deliver projects because you have the right system in place and the right people in place, then your confidence going out and getting work is going to be even that much greater. And you're going to, you're going to have this massive desire to just keep feeding the machine. And that's what we used to call it, feeding the machine, because we created a machine. And so our jobs were, how do we feed the machine today? What else could we do? You know, if we don't have 15 or 20 jobs going at once, I'm getting nervous. You know, to say that the most contractors, it blows their mind. How do you have 15 jobs going at once? Well, you have 15, we have 15 different project managers. Each project manager could handle anywhere between 5 and 15 jobs, depending on the size. Right? So and then when you when you think of it that way, then I look at every single PM as a profit center because if this, if this PM costs me X, Y, Z a year, but I know he's going to deliver me 30 points on every job and he can handle 10 jobs at once. Well, then I know how much money I'm going to be able to get out of that PM. Mm. So then I'm scaling on, on a, on a per person basis. I know I need to hit a certain number. I need more men. I need more project managers because being, being a part of the union, uh, it diminishes my, my uh, my need for figuring out how I get labor. Mm. I pay the union because if I need men, I get men. 
even if they have to pull guys off the bench or get a traveler, if I need 75 electricians on a site tomorrow, I'm going to get it. Right. So now, so then I'm, I'm not, I'm not uh, limited by the amount of manpower. Now I'm limited by the amount of work I can get. But then typically if I have a bad system in, in, in place, I'll be limited by the amount of work I can get and by the amount of work my people can handle. So then I end up in a constant, what I call a constant gardening effort of recruiting and trying to cultivate project managers because each one of them I look at as a profit silo. So I kind of look at the contracting business a little bit different than traditional eyes. I see it through a different lens. Yeah. And and because of that, uh, I believe that was the reason why we were able to scale so quickly and, and do what we've done. That is something that you do today for business owners, for construction owners in particular. Yeah, I do that for contractors every day. I, I, I embed with them. Uh, you know, on a consulting basis, and I take the the business apart. I get in their sock drawer, and we recreate all the systems that are required. Lucky them that that they don't have to reinvent the wheel. They can just yeah. reach out to you when you were. They, they have to face the fear a lot. It's it's tough to look in the mirror. Yeah. So that's the biggest thing I find is 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 to to get people in a position where they don't take offense. That you know, I'm not insulting their baby, but I have to take this thing apart. We got to look in the mirror here and be honest with ourselves. Don't kill the messenger. And then the next thing is, is if I put systems in place, but you don't run this, you don't have a corporate culture here that's a real business. What the systems are meaningless. If we don't have SOPs and checklists and our culture is one of excellence and the leadership promotes a corporatism, meaning we have a system, we have a means and methods, a methodology on how we, how we operate every function in this business from the back of the, the house to the front of the house. That's how we that's how we always talked about it in our business from the back of the back of the house is estimating front of the house is project management and, and all the C-suite activities from the back of the house to the front of the house. If there isn't a very strong leader that says, hey, do not deviate from the SOPs, it's paint by number. OK, then you'll have then you can scale. But if you if everybody's doing something different and they're deviating, then you've got a bunch of oars in the, in the ocean and they're going in a different direction and you're not going anywhere. Mm. So everybody has to be, uh, you know, in line. And what I noticed was just an aside, the more organized and compartmentalized you can get in a contracting company, the longer your people will stay with you. What I've noticed is that the more entrepreneurial, the more unorganized um, the business is, the less my employees would stay. The more regimented and the more, the more defined I could get in their duties and responsibilities – the better they performed. And I think that's just an interesting take on human nature and the difference between an employee and an entrepreneur. As an entrepreneur, we like unorganization and chaos. We can operate in that world. And what we end up doing is we end up using that and creating a framework that dr drives revenue. Employees do not. They, they get a job because they're looking for security. And if they don't have a framework, a very specific duties, tasks, and responsibility framework, then they don't feel like they're secure and they don't feel like they're working for a real business. And what they do is they would leave me and go to work for the city where there's no upward mobility and potential, but there's massive framework in compartmentalization. And I always, always struck me because I'm like, listen, if, if you stay with me and you make me money, I'm going to write you bonuses at the end of the year at my discretion. But I'm going to write your bonuses. You're going to feel like you're working on Wall Street if we make a lot of money. I ain't a pig. And that that money carrot was meaningless because wow. they're not entrepreneurial minded. And then I and they would go to other larger companies, and all of those companies were way corporate. They're publicly traded. You know, like you know, you know, one of these companies where oh, I don't do that. That's this guy's department. Take that and talk to him. Whereas an entrepreneur, that's repulsive to us. We want to. You want your people to be able to get up and work over here and then also work over there. And, and that's a fairy tale. Mm. Employees do not operate that way. That's one guy in your business who can do all those things. Employees show up, they get a paycheck. They want to get their coffee, eat the bagel at the desk, grind their farts in a chair and operate on a very specific SOP and say, this is my job. I did it. Nobody can say I didn't do my job today. Get up at four o'clock and go home. The more, the more of that type of environment I created, the more money we made which is totally contra to every impulse in my body. 
And that was part of those, one of those learning lessons that I was trying to elucidate earlier, that I had to learn that. I had to learn that employees are very specific resources to use them as tools specifically. And once you do, you will prosper as an entrepreneur. That's great advice. And did you do anything fun with the employees? Was there any, you know, downtime or events that you would throw for the employees to make them feel special? No, uh, we, we had, we had Christmas parties. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, uh, you know, in the early days, in the earlier days, Christmas parties would be, you know, um, open bar. And then later I stopped that. Too much trouble. Yeah. You know, guys get out of hand, you know, we're in construction. (laughs) <laughs> you know, so, you know, guys get out of hand and stuff like that. And I don't want that liability. See, I'm a risk manager, bro. Yeah. So, you yeah. know, once you have something to lose, yeah. Once you have something to lose, I don't want people getting, cause then I have to, now I got to get, you know, 30 black cars mm-hmm. and I got to have them drive people home cause they're getting whacked and saying, insulting their coworkers cause they're drunk at a Christmas party. I don't need that headache, but you yeah. know, my, the main guys, you know, the, the top guys, so, so let me explain another concept, if I may. Yeah. Um, there's more to rewarding people besides money. And um, when you're a strong leader, and people respect you. So this, you have to earn the respect of your people, mm-hmm. not just sign the check. You, you have to be, you can't ask people to do things that you couldn't do. So in, in, my, in, in the contracting business, I could do everything at the highest level. And that was what part of drove me. I wanted to be great at everything. If I had to do the shop, the submittal log and do the shop drawings, I would be the best shop drawing and submittal guy. If I got to do takeoffs, I'm the best takeoff guy, the best estimator. I'm the best project manager. If I I have to do a CPM schedule, I'm on it like a hornet. Mm. Right. Aside from the C-suite stuff and the contracts and the delay claims and all that, all that stuff. So I really believe in competency and your people knowing that you are competent. You're one of the smartest guys walking around here. Okay. That is very important to me. That's called altitude. That's a part of my philosophy. ALP is my company, altitude, logic, and pressure. I believe that those, that's what that stands for. And those concepts need to be at play and known at all times, uh, especially to get a deal done. But I think altitude is huge. So once you've earned their respect as a leader and you have altitude, Another way to reward people is with your attention. Mm. So if you're doing the right thing and you're following procedures and we're making money and you're being professional and you're taking this serious, our shop is very serious minded, bro. We're there. We're there not for our health. We're there to make money. And like I told you, I view the business like a hedge fund. I'm deploying capital, get a return. Now I'm not a bastard about it, you know, I'm, you know, but at, at, at the same time, they understand that there's a strong leader there and that he's got his eyes on everything. When the cat's away, the mice will play. That is for sure. So they need to know that there's a strong person there who you can't get one over. Once you earn that uh, that reputation, then the guys that do good things want to get in your inner circle. And if they see that you give praise and you take guys to lunch who are doing the right thing, It creates a competitive environment in the workplace. So I don't have to take them to wherever and give them tickets to a show or go to a Yankee game. They'd much rather go to a lunch with me. And so I would reward people with my time. If you do the right thing, you get next to me. and You become in the inner circle. If you don't, then you don't get the time. And that's how I manage. And I believe that that's very effective. You sound like the Michael Jordan of construction bosses. He almost had that same essence to him. He had his mind on straight. He knew exactly what he needed to do. And if he gave you his attention, you know, you were listening. Yeah, so, yeah. And people want it. They yearn for it. People yeah. want to go to work. I genuinely believe people want to go to work and they want to be praised and they want to do a good job. Yeah. Obviously, you find people who don't care. But, I mean, for the for the majority of people that have kids and have a house and – they're adults, you know, they want to go to work and they want to know that they're doing a good job and they want to do a good job. They want to go home at night and say, I work today. I did a good job. I did what I'm supposed to do. Right. So, you know, I wanted to cultivate that environment where if you come here and you do a good job, not only is the end of the year good, but then you also get access to the C-suite. You get access to my time. You get perks. There are perks to that. Right. 
yeah. without me having to, like I said, you know, take him out and do things. And I just want to, I just want to say something else on that, on that line. Also, we start very early in this business. My men are on the tools at seven o'clock in the morning, right? So I'm in the office at six 30. Mm. So, you know, come four or five o'clock, these guys are home. They're shot. These people, my, my people are exhausted to then say, Hey, Wednesday, let's go out for happy hour and train. It's not, that's not in the culture of this industry, mm -mm. you know, because like I said, we're a hardcore contracting outfit. Now, if I was like selling machines, if I was selling slide gates and stuff like that, yeah, I'd want to go out with engineers and take them to drinks and that type of thing. But like the people that are working for us, these are these are construction people. You know, they're asleep at eight eight thirty at night. They're up at four o'clock in the morning. Yep. You know, so it's also a little bit of a different dynamic. You know, did you have that same respect for your dad when you guys would be driving around? Did he ever point out, "Hey, dad built that" or anything like that? Where you thought that was amazing? Constantly. It's the only thing that ever we ever talked about. Our our family identity was construction. You know how you, like you grow up and you got some some kids at a neighborhood and you know them. They have some sort of identity for a reason. Oh, this is John. Oh, that guy. His dad's a cop. That's yep. the cop's house. That's the, this guy's house. Right. Our family identity was we were we were contractors. We were construction guys. So it was just, you know, it's just no, the norm. That's all we talked about. And my mother is a saint because my mother dealt with all that. She was highly supportive of it. She, you know, you know, old school. She raised the kids. She was at home. She supported my dad and everything that he did. And, and uh, they worked as a team. So dinner talk was construction talk quite a bit. Always. It's always dad unwinding. Right. Yeah. So it always would devolve into that. Right. But, you know. We had normal dinners and my mom would talk about the day and what's going on with school. Like, you know, I had tutors growing up. So, you know, right after dinner, the tutor would, the tutor would come. So we talk about school and what I've done and my homework and if I'm prepared. My dad was big on that when I got in high school. Hmm. And uh, so, yeah, it's funny. I lived, I lived two different lives. When I was younger, we didn't have much money. Okay. I guess that's the life of everybody. They're starting something. They're getting their life together, right? And then as I got a little bit older, our socioeconomics changed. And I think that was when my dad really started to understand business and try to become more of a CEO. And uh, he was, you know, big on that. So I had tutors come uh, after dinner. So we had normal dinners, but it would always devolve into the machinations of the day and screw this guy and this sub screw me and his engineer sucks and, you know, all that every day. When you have to attract newer, younger contractors let's say straight out of high school is it getting harder these days um well contractors you, you mean workers workers yeah okay so extremely difficult listen quite honestly lou part of the reason why you know me and why i do what i do is because i'm trying to bring a different light to this business and i'm doing my best to bring more talent into it mm. it's, in my opinion it's the greatest business on the face of the earth I'm obviously biased, but you can make all your financial dreams a reality in this business. You don't have to go to Wall Street and push paper around. You can build things for humanity and civilization. Concurrent with that, you can employ a lot of people at wages that are very competitive. You know, in contracting, especially, you know, when you do the big jobs, prevailing wage and union rates, these guys make good, very good money for what they do. And that allows them to live a certain lifestyle, send their kids to private schools or live in certain neighborhoods and, you know, save up and get a Corvette for the weekends and live a certain lifestyle. And construction affords every it affords a 360 win for everyone. The contractors can make money. The workers themselves could do very well. And then what we're delivering, the product that we're delivering for the owner is exactly what they want. Mm. I think it's I think it's the best business, but. It's not promoted. It's looked down upon. And my whole life, when I've when I've told people I'm in I'm in construction, they look at me like you're in construction, because you know people I know I'm educated. I went to school, and they would go, "You're in construction," and because they were equating construction with doing somebody's bathroom, like yeah, how do you think that bridge was built, dude? That you drove over today? That's construction, man. That's the stuff I do. When you flush the toilet, where do you think the water goes? You There's turn the tap levels. on the water system. Where the hell do you think that's coming from, man? <laughs> so we, 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 because it is so essential, 
And because honestly, we work in silence. These the men go to work every day, and they perform their tasks and they go home. Okay, and and they're not. We they don't make TV shows about us, and we're not in movies and stuff like that. So people take what we do for granted, even though it's what it's the anchor of civilization. And I want the young people who are talented, who would go down to Wall Street because they want to make a lot of money. I want them to reconsider. And I and I would also argue that I can get you to two hundred thousand dollars faster in contracting than you can get to two hundred thousand dollars in Wall Street if you didn't go to an Ivy. And so I'm trying to make that more appetizing to the youth, and that's why you've seen my presence on social and and because. Nobody in my in our industry is doing it. All the guys that know me my whole life, they laugh at me. I see them looking on LinkedIn because none of them will get in front of a camera and none of them will tell you how they did it. Mm. Right? It goes back to the little conversation we had earlier about the coaches that are out there. Yeah. You know, there, there, there may be coaches that are better than me out there that have scaled into four or 500 million. I only did 100 million. I've done two and a half billion in construction. Right, but they've taken their companies to four, five, six hundred million and beyond. They're never going to get in front of a camera. And they are certainly never going to come into somebody's office and tell them how to do it. Except wow. me. So I, I, I'm trying. I'm, I'm not, listen, I'm not a saint either. I'm getting paid for my time. Of course. But it's the only thing I know how to do. I can go to I couldn't go do anything else if I wanted to. Everything an, all I do is I look at buildings. I'm looking at everything. What can be done? What can I build here? That's just, you know, it's all I know. So I'm doing my part to bring this industry that's given me so much and afforded a lifestyle that I currently live in and allowed me to have the afford me the life that I've had vis-a-vis -vis, uh, our business. Um, I'm trying to make that more known so we can get better talent in our industry. I mean, there's an ROI for your service. So it's not like they're just paying and not getting anything out of Massive it. Massive ROI. The thing is that they got to get there here. The biggest issue I find is that, you know, if I take a guy, like I just took a guy and I scaled him this year, the past 11 months, he was on the tools. He's been on the tools since he's 54 years old. He's on the tools until he's 53. Oh, wow. I took him off the tools. In 11 months, he went from 650000 in revenue to $12 million. In fact, that's where I am now. I'm in Florida, and when I'm done with this, I'm going to go to, in his office and see him. His, be, his name is Betancourt Construction, St. Petersburg, Florida. Guy's name is Brian Betancourt. I've done an interview with him. You can find him on my YouTube and everything. The Absolutely. biggest issue that that he has is he's not, he's 54. He's never been a CEO. Okay. So the, the the thing the issue is is there's a point where yes, we're building stuff. Yes. Means and methods are important. That's why this business is so dynamic. Yes, you need to know how to put pucks in a net. Yes, you need to be able to look at drawings and take it off. You need to know how to do this whole thing. But then there's a whole other world outside of it that you also need to know how to do as an executive and as a CEO, putting systems and strategies in place, and then put taking the tool belt off, putting on a white shirt, going out there and closing deals like a professional and articulating yourself and advocating for your business. So you have to be everything in this business. It is so dynamic. That's why some of the greatest entrepreneurs come from construction and real estate development. Because there's so many moving pieces. You have to be a really dynamic brain. Imagine if all I had to do was just do stocks all day. Or I just had to do this one thing all day. I mean, I, I wish. I could do 150. I got to be a doctor, a lawyer, an accountant, an engineer, an architect, a carpenter. A I got to be everything. You know, so the biggest thing that I find is that their inability to really start believing that they're a CEO and that they can be one. And that that's the biggest hump. So I have to I have to get them to believe that they can make money. Once they start making money and seeing margins, they go, oh, wow, this is really working. Wow, this could work. Then I got to take it to the next level. And that's the hardest part, because you need people in this business to grow. Can't no. have a three man shop and go to 100 million. No. Absolutely not. How and so that's where the CEO and the leadership comes into play. Yeah. Yeah. When you're implementing those systems, how important is technology? Uh, well, the systems are, are tracked vis-a-vis -vis technology. I mean, I, I'll tell you, I'm a mix of I'm a mix of two. I okay. use technology and I leverage it uh, as I feel is appropriate. There, are, listen, there are times where you can get too bogged down in the tech. Mm. 
remember, there is going to be a difference between the people that sit in the office all day and the tech that they're running and they're working out of and their workstations, and then the data that they need from the field. Those guys aren't always loving tech. Right. So our business is, is going to be a mixture of some of the tactile and the tech. For instance, like when I run change orders, I have change order folders. They're red. And I run it by a folder system. And on the front of that folder, I have the SOP and the checklist for change orders. Okay. Then when that change order gets handed off to the appropriate party, then it gets put into the tech. But my PMs aren't doing that. They're going to grab a red folder. Boom, that's a change order. All those red folders already have pre-stapled on them. The SOP for a change order and the checklist that's required. I make it paint by number for these guys. Mm. Okay. And once they're done, they check it all up. They've got to sign the front of it. Once that's signed, attesting to then following the rules and, and going through the checklist, then it comes back to the office to get processed, and then that's all tech. So it's a mixture of the two. Okay. If I left it up to them in the field, Lou, would never happen. <laughs> No. They'd be prosecuting change orders without them being approved. I wouldn't know about it. It wouldn't be cost coded. I wouldn't have it. I couldn't track it. I wouldn't know what the hell is going on. And then in the PM meetings that I have with them, they'll sit there and they'll lie right to my face. Right. That's what PMs do. They will lie to you 100 out of 100. They don't want to get reamed out. And if, especially if the project has a long duration, Lou, they're, they know what they're missing. And so they're saying, well, I got time. I don't got to tell Wilkinson yet. I'm going to rob Peter to pay Paul. I could horse trade with this guy, and I don't play that. I need to know what's up right now, not because I want to reprimand you, because I don't want to be blindsided. So right. let me know so I can come in and I can guide you because I want to know what's going on with the money. Right? So there's, like I said, I don't know how anybody could ever be a, a coach or a consultant in construction without knowing this business in and out. There's so many unique peculiarities in this business to do it right. That, uh, you know, if you're not a contractor, I don't know how you could ever call yourself a consultant or a coach. This is really important. And for everybody that's listening right now, I want you to definitely pay attention to this. Knowing that Marshall is in construction and can help you with your business, where can they find you, Marshall? Where can they get a hold of you and reach out to you for help? Um. Well, you can find me at uh, marshallwilkinson.com, um, altitudelogicpressure.com. That's my main site. Okay. And that's the consulting site. And you can find me at, at Real Marshall Wilkinson on Instagram. That's probably where I'm the most active. Um, and you can pop me in Google. You can find me there too. You are very well known and have a lot of followers. One of the last questions I have for you before we want to wrap up is, do you have any advice for new construction owners that you would like to share with our listeners? Yes, absolutely, man. I'm full of it. I'm full of the advice, but for specifically for the new guys yeah. that are coming in, I would say it's a great opportunity for you now to start getting organized. So one of the biggest things and biggest issues, Lou, that you're going to see, you're, you're, I'm sure you've come across it and that I see constantly, is in the beginning phases of the business, what, you're, what you are focused on solely is just getting work. You need money. Hmm. So you, you're trying to get customers. And then to the detriment of the back office. But that's the perfect time to set up the back office because you don't have so much work. You know, when I when I have to go in and, and I have to, you know, reassemble these companies and they and they've been around for so long, it is a nightmare. All the entanglements and 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 the people that are the stuck in their ways and you try to put a new system on them and it's total chaos. Right now, do it right at the beginning. So start getting organized. Everything starts with organization. Start getting organized. And I would say most importantly. Make sure that you put in place a very robust and, and uh, you know, easy to use, but robust uh, job cost tracking system. You need to know what your committed costs are. Can I just explain that really quick before we go? Please. Because I don't want to, I don't want to leave them with, yeah, I don't want them to uh, leave them with something and, and then they feel unfulfilled and they can't do it. Okay. Most importantly, you need to know what your committed costs are. This is for the job cost tracking. This is required your committed costs are your build price so quickly open up an excel spreadsheet create a job number every all jobs should be 
by job number, by the way, not by the customer name. Should be job number. So this is 2023. Let's say this is your first job in 2023. The job number should be 2301. The next one should be 2302, right? Create a job number system. The first thing I want you to do is put the contract value in a column. The next thing I want you to do is put the committed cost in the column. Committed cost is what your actual build price is. The reason why it's called committed cost is because that's what you're committing to have to pay, right? Because the delta between contract value and committed cost is what we make, right? Mm. It should be 30 points or die. So your contract value in one column, the other column is your committed cost. The next one is current committed cost because your committed cost could change. Okay. You know why your committed cost could change, Lou? I don't want to put you on the spot. <laughs> Tell me. It could change because of change orders. Yes. Right. So my committed cost changed because my contract value increased increased because of change orders. Here's the thing. What if your current committed costs increase and your contract value doesn't increase? That means that you're missing scope. That yeah. maybe you you had to give a, a subcontractor a change order that you can't go to the owner to. You're losing money. You need to know that. Then the next column is going to be my actual committed. It's what I have actually committed to date. Does that make sense? What I've actually spent to date. So my, my original committed costs are my build price, my current committed costs, and my actual committed costs. And then you have to have your change order column in case there's any change orders or change order values. If you could do something very simple like that, very simple. In the next column, I want you to put a column I call it the gross clear. So the delta between my current committed costs and my current contract value is what I'm clearing. Okay. And put it in a formula in the next column for a percentage and watch that thing and make sure it don't go below 30. The next portion of this, though, is very important. All of these systems in a very simple tracker like that, which is like ABC123, but you'd be surprised how many guys don't have it is that bad data in, bad data out. If you don't do a constant gardening effort, these tools are worthless to you. So here's how you make them perfect. You've got to commit to yourself and make a promise that you're going to go by, this is what my, my dad used to go by, Sam Walton sundown method. You know Sam Walton, the founder of Walmart, you know, Sam's Club? Yes, yep. What he would do was before he left for the day, just as this, just as, his cashier would reconcile the the register for the day. If you worked at a retail store before you go home, you can't just leave all that cash in the register. You have to reconcile it, close out the books for the day. Yep. You got to do the same thing as a contractor. So take 30 minutes and reconcile the day. And all you need to do is input if you got a payment today, input if you got a change order today, or input if you bought out a new sub today. That's it. Just three things. Because those affect your committed cost. If you didn't, then you don't have to put anything in that tracker. If you did, take 10 seconds and put it in, create the formula, and it'll automatically calculate. And this way, every morning, when you have your cup of coffee, you pull that tracker up, and you know where you are in any at any given time of the day on that job. And that's wow. the most dialed you can get in organized in the beginning phases. And then we can get more complex after that. But that's that's... Uh, you know what I would recommend that the new guys start to do. Okay. And for those templates that you're talking about, is that something that they could potentially get from you? Um, I don't sell them. Okay. Uh, I create them. I build out systems for my customers. Okay. Um, so that would be something that I would, I could either embed with them, which is what I, I prefer going to their office, meeting them, yep. meeting me face to face, meeting their people, because then I could give them a much better analysis of their people and how I really think it should be tailored to them specifically. Mm. Uh, that's one option. The other option is I also could just build out these systems replicated like mine. I could do that remotely. But I get this question a lot, Lou. And so what I really think I'm going to do over the break here, this Christmas break that we have coming up, I'm shutting things down for about a week. Okay. Uh, and so I really think it's probably a good thing for me to create a bunch of these templates and shoot a course and put it in my university for the guys that can't afford to have me come out. So at okay. least they could start doing it on their own. And then what I think is probably more cost effective that they start to do it. Then they get some of my time remotely. And then I look at it on the zoom and I can direct them what's right and what's wrong and what should be tweaked. And then they actually have a pride in work that they did it themselves. 
Mm. So I think I'm going to start offering that. But as of today, I, I do not offer that. Marshall, thank you so much for being a guest. There's a lot of value that the listeners can take away from today. Well, thank you, Lou. I appreciate it. It's been uh, my pleasure. And everyone else, please like, subscribe, comment, share the Builder Upper Show with anyone in construction. We will see you next time. If you're a construction contractor and would like to appear as a guest on our podcast, write us an email. It's lou at lumberfy.com.